Joe and the worship team for a rich time of worship together. And thank you, Nate and Janet, for that. It's a blessing to be at church this morning. Amen. A little bit cold, but spring is on its way. I hope you enjoyed the sun yesterday. I certainly did. And uh, it's always a thrill for me when uh, New Hampshire gets to springtime because it's a wonderful place to be in the spring and in the summer. Dawn, did you have a, a special announcement this morning? Not this morning? Okay. All right. If you have your Bibles, um, boy, I don't know exactly the passage to open to. Probably Acts 26. You can keep your finger there. But we're going to be in various passages this morning. We're taking our departure from Luke chapter 3, which we've been in, looking at the initial ministry of John the Baptist, which focused on repentance. Uh, Luke summarizes it there in Luke 3, 8, um, where John says, Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And then it goes on. We ended there last week. And we're taking a, a departure from there to open this up to the doctrine of repentance and surveying, really, the New Testament uh, with a focus on, on Luke's gospel and the book of Acts, which he wrote both of those, to look at how this uh, weaves into the gospel message. The title for this morning's message, the, the first in this sort of doctrinal series, is Repentance and Essential of the Gospel. Repentance and Essential of the Gospel. Let me uh, begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll get into it this morning. Father in heaven, as a church together, we come before you, and we pray for our time in your word this morning. And Lord, we think also of other believers and churches in the world today who have met to worship you and give praise to you, those that you have called to faith in your Son. We think of our brothers and sisters in Mali and this network of churches centered in Bamako and the Baptist mission there. We pray for them. We pray for their church planting efforts and their evangelism in the villages. Lord, please protect them from Satan and his temptations and also those who would harm your cause in the gospel. Thank you for the wonderful provision for them in the building of these houses and church buildings. Continue to bless their ministry. Give them stout hearts of courage to continue in the work, hearts of faith to trust you. And we thank you, Lord, so much for the connection we have with them through the Hanes and through their long-term ministry there. We pray for those in our body who are suffering through loss of loved ones and through physical ailments. We pray for your comfort for them and for your healing for them. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word on this topic, that it would be clear and compelling, that we would see just how consistent this theme is, but also, Lord, that it would soften our hearts to the need for us to continually look to you in repentance and faith, to examine ourselves, to walk humbly before you and honestly before you and in the light. Lord, I pray for your help this morning to speak as I ought to speak and pray that your spirit would illumine our minds to understand these truths. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There are often very pertinent and practical and personal questions that relate to the doctrine of salvation. Earlier this year, I began a Sunday school class that was focused on the topic of theology proper. When it comes to theology, the study of God, there are various branches in theology. And the first lot of theology proper, and that is a study of God. It focuses on the attributes of God, who really even before he created anything. Who is God and what are his attributes? What is he like? And it is the most important and most central topic of theology because it has a bearing on all the other subjects and all the other branches of theology. And it really has a bearing on how we understand everything because everything proceeded from God. He created everything. Everything in some way points to him, much like an artist's body of work points to 
attributes and uh, characteristics of an artist, everything in some way touches upon the character of God. But in that Sunday school class, it was inevitable that many of our discussions ended up being about the doctrine of salvation, because that is where the doctrine of God becomes most pertinent to me and to the most important questions about life and my eternity and my soul and the soul of my loved ones and things like that. The essential question is always, how can I be right with God? Or how can I go to heaven? How can I be sure of my salvation? Is that even possible? These are basic and fundamental questions that most people ask. And the answer throughout Scripture is very simply, through repentant faith in Christ. I can be right with God. I can have eternal life, and I can have assurance of that eternal life through repentant faith in Christ. That is the gospel. But the issue of repentance being part of the gospel has not always been agreed upon, especially in recent church history. I mentioned at the outset last week that one of the best ways to go about answering the question about repentance is to be like the noble Bereans who searched the scriptures to see whether what Paul preached was true. And that's a reference to his ministry in the city of Berea in Acts 16. If you want to turn there, you can see that verse, Acts 6, uh, I'm sorry, Acts 17, verse 10. This is right on the heels of his ministry in Thessalonica a city in northern Greece after he had gone into Macedonia during his second missionary journey. It says there in Acts 17.10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. This was typical of Paul's ministry. When he came into a new city, he would start his ministry by proclaiming the gospel in the synagogue. It says there in verse 11, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And they have become known as the noble Bereans. In Thessalonica, as is implied here, Paul was chased out of the synagogue there and persecuted because of his gospel. But in contrast, here in Berea, they listened to Paul. It was new to them. And in light of that, they received the word and with great eagerness examined the scriptures daily to see whether that was true. This should be our approach as a church and our methodology for believing whatever is taught. The scriptures, examining them, continually, fairly and rightly interpreted. And really the legacy of this church is to do that very thing and to do it eagerly. In this series on repentance, what I'm looking for is for you to engage that way with the scriptures, to not just read them casually, but to follow along and to engage and examine to see whether these things are so. And if there's any question about whether this is new or novel, it's not. Pastor Cook taught exactly on this same issue for his entire time here, and he and I are in 100% an absolute wholesale agreement on these things. So shouldn't sound new. Might sound a little bit tailored to, you know, my personality and things like that. But this should sound familiar. This morning, essentially, I want to demonstrate that repentance is essential to the gospel. That's the title of this morning's message. It's the main goal this morning just to demonstrate plainly and it won't be exhaustively. We won't touch on every passage and every detail in those passages but to demonstrate plainly that this is the truth, that repentance is an essential of the gospel, both in the content of the gospel message and in what is necessary in responding to that gospel message as a hearer. Now, this, these two points, I think, can be demonstrated irrefutably through Luke's two books, his gospel and the book of Acts. And I'd like us to do a brief survey. Here's what we need to keep in mind as we do it. First, always the source of answering these kinds of questions is going to be God's word. 
It is his revelation of the truth of these issues, right? We would be left to our own best guesses and our own sort of intuition and common sense, sort of our knowledge and our experience to answer these questions without God having revealed them to us. But he has given us a scripture so that we will know his mind on these issues. And so we come to the text of scripture with these questions. The Bible does reveal how we can be saved through faith in Christ. And it is a kind of faith that is more than just a mental assent or an affirmation to the historical facts of the gospel. Someone can agree and believe that Jesus historically came to earth, that he died on a cross, even believing that he died on a cross for sin, and even believing that he was raised again. The issue is believing that he died on the cross for my sin because I needed a Savior and he is a substitute for my sin. It is different. There is a a distinction there that recognizes that it's my sin that necessitated such a cruel death for the Son of God. And that I am guilty before God. And that is those are the seeds of repentant faith. Repentant faith. So this morning, we want to begin this sort of outline and survey in answering this question about repentance and demonstrating that repentance is essential to the gospel. So I've outlined this, and we won't finish it all this morning. There are two main points in this portion of our study on the doctrine of repentance. And the first is the declaration of repentance. So if you're taking notes, number one, the declaration of repentance. In other words, repentance is essential when proclaiming the gospel. And the second one is similar, and that is the depiction of repentance. Number two, which we won't get to this morning, but the depiction of repentance. And these two points really come from what I found in Scripture, in Luke's Gospel and the other Gospels, and then also in the book of Acts, that there are times where we see clear examples of how the Gospel is declared and proclaimed, and those examples include repentance. And then there are other myriads of examples where we see the depiction of repentance in those who hear the gospel, either uh, conveyed from Christ himself or later proclaimed by the apostles, and those hearers respond with repentance. It's all over the New Testament in both ways. So that's how I want to organize these passages for our study. So I want to look this morning at the Declaration of Repentance. That will be our main theme throughout for this morning. And to demonstrate that repentance is essential when proclaiming the gospel. And there's several ways that we can demonstrate this. Now at the outset, what I want to begin with is just a couple key places. If we think about Luke's gospel and then the book of Acts, there's a lot of time and progress of the gospel in those two books. Luke's gospel, as well as the other gospels, really begin to describe gospel sort of progress with John the Baptist, like we've talked about, and then Jesus' initial ministry. And then at the end of Luke's gospel, Christ is raised and he gives a great commission. And then we see in the book of Acts, his next book, that he demonstrates how the gospel goes from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, particularly through the the apostles' proclamation of that gospel. And by the end, we're left with Paul in prison, and the gospel continues down throughout church history. So I want, at the beginning here, to jump in some key places in that whole progress and look at a couple summaries of the gospel proclaimed. That's A on your outline. Summaries of the gospel proclaimed. In other words, In some of these passages, we have a condensed version of what the gospel message was in the proclamation by Jesus, John, and the apostles. Later on, we'll look at a couple examples from Jesus himself. So let's look at a couple key points in Luke's gospel in the book of Acts. And we'll see that there's a clear continuity between these. First, summaries of John and Jesus. Summaries of John and Jesus. Jesus. 
And we're going to borrow from Matthew and Mark's gospel here for a moment. If you have uh, your Bibles open, you can turn to Matthew chapter 3. And again, just like Luke, after Matthew describes sort of the backstory of Jesus and his birth, he comes to the initial part of Christ's ministry, which is starting with John the Baptist. Notice Matthew 3 verse 1. Now, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. This should sound familiar because we're at the same sort of point in, in the chronology in Luke's gospel. Verse 2, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the key principle I want you to see is a chapter later in Matthew 4, verse 17. We can start in verse 12, actually. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. So John was persecuted because of his preaching, particularly against Herod and his lifestyle, is now thrown into prison. And verse 17 says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All right, so you look back at chapter 3, verse 2. John's message, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what is, what is really important is for us to mem remember our good sort of interpreting methods and remember that when we read the Bible, we're always after the author's intended meaning. All right? And so what we see here is that Matthew, the inspired writer of this gospel, is now summarizing. John's proclamation and Jesus's proclamation, and he does it word for word. They both say the same things. He summarizes their message the same way. And so we can ask, why does Matthew do that? We see in other gospels that there are slight variations. Could it be that Matthew is trying to convey to the reader the very simple point that John's proclamation was nearly identical to Jesus's. And that when John proclaimed and, and, and called people to repentance and he baptized them in preparation for the Messiah, that when he got thrown in prison, that Jesus picked up where he left off. Now we know that there are distinctions and the gospel becomes more specific and more particular in light of what Christ does on the cross and his resurrection, etc. But at the very baseline, there is continuity between the two messages. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we see there, at the very sort of foundational uh, content of the gospel, right at the core, is a summons to repentance. Okay? So that's the first summary that we see. And it's right at the beginning of Christ's ministry. It's right at the beginning of the gospel presentation. Same thing in Mark's gospel. If you turn over there, to Mark chapter 1. Mark is uh, briefer when it comes to the birth narratives. He doesn't include anything about Christ's birth or John the Baptist's birth like in Luke. He ushers right into the ministry of John the Baptist. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He quotes from Malachi and Isaiah about John's ministry. Verse 4, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Same as Luke chapter 3. Notice later on, down in verse 14, now after John had been taken into custody, same as Matthew, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. And in light of those phrase, phrases used later in Mark's gospel, it's very clear what he is describing. This summarizes Jesus' message. And we see that unfold and develop later in the gospels. We'll get there in a moment. So obviously, repentance is very central and essential to John and Jesus' uh, message or gospel. Now, I mentioned at the beginning this morning that there was a debate surrounding this issue. And we're going to uh, spend more time on this, maybe one message devoted to this later. But just in summary, there were some older, very uh, distinct theologians. And I may step on some toes here, but uh, please hear me out. I don't want to be misunderstood. 
some very older distinct theologians of the classical dispensationalist type. This is about 70 years ago. Okay, so it's been a long time. Things have changed. C.I. Schofield would have been one of them. Lewis Sperry Schaefer. Later on, in the next generation, Charles Ryrie. And then also Zane Hodges. And they taught that repentance here in the early stages of Christ's ministry represented a distinct gospel message namely a gospel of the kingdom for the Jews. And that this was different from the gospel message of grace that Paul later on preached to the Gentiles, which became the church. That's what they taught. And they claimed that repentance was included here to Israel because it represented the same theme of a works-based kind of salvation that was similar to them being under the law, or that they were already in covenant with God, and therefore this summons to repentance in light of the coming kingdom was about them making things right in their covenant with God because the kingdom was there and at hand. Now, the result was a very influential kind of theology. This theology trickled down from the hallowed halls of Dallas Seminary and influenced thousands of pulpits across America and hundreds of professorships across the country for about 70 years. I have an ear for their argument about this. I've listened to the arguments. I've studied the theology. This is what I was first exposed to as a Christian in church. I was taught this. When I would ask questions about the Sermon on the Mount, I would be told, well, that was just for the Jewish nation at that time. In fact, when I worked at Camp Good News, this came up uh, in our ministry because much of the curriculum that CEF was using at the time had been written by two doctoral students from Dallas Seminary. And there was no repentance in the curriculum at all. Actually, if you were here in those days, Alan Burns wrote a paper, a position paper on repentance and sent it to the national headquarters demonstrating some of these same things. All right. So I don't say that to throw stones, but just to tell you, that's some of the historical sort of mooring for this uh, discussion and debate. And it really came to a head in the 80s and 90s. That's what they would say about this initial part of Jesus's ministry. But I want us to keep in mind how these same themes develop as, as, as the progress of the gospel goes on, and especially into the book of Acts, when we do find the apostles proclaiming the gospel to Gentiles, and especially Paul to Gentiles. So let's jump over to the next major section here in Luke's gospel, which is way at the end. Luke chapter 24. This is after Christ's resurrection, the very last portion of the gospel of Luke. This is Jesus' final uh, great commission and command to his apostles on what they're to preach after he's ascended back to heaven. And we find here that this is, there is again an emphasis on repentance and that it is not just repentance for Jews, but very clearly and explicitly for Gentiles as well. Luke 24, we can start in verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, these are his disciples, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city, Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. Now, if you know the beginning of the book of Acts, that's where Luke begins his next book with the Great Commission. 
but it says very specifically here from the mouth of Christ himself to his apostles before he ascends to heaven that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. It's not just the message for the Jews. It is to be the consistent message of the gospel for the Jews and for the Gentiles, the nations, the Goyim. And he says, beginning from Jerusalem. We know in the book of Acts, when Peter first proclaimed the gospel in Jerusalem, he told them, repent and be baptized, and thousands were saved. That same message is to go on through the rest of the apostles out to the rest of the nations as well. And notice also, there's a connection here with Luke, the author. Verse 47, he uses this phrase, repentance for forgiveness of sins. This is the same phrase we heard last week in Luke 3.3 when he summarizes John the Baptist's message. And he went into all the region around Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so I think here Luke is doing the same something similar as Matthew when he summarizes the gospel message. It's repentance for the forgiveness of sins. John proclaimed it in a unique way as a forerunner to the Messiah, baptizing people as they repented, and the apostles would go out proclaiming something similar, repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but now in particular, verse 47, in the name of Jesus, in light of the cross, in light of his resurrection. So the the apostles go out, They proclaim this both to Jews in Jerusalem and then on to the Gentiles as well. Now, the two main catalysts for this, as we get into the book of Acts, are Peter and Paul. We find a summary of Peter's ministry in Acts 11. So again, jumping jumping into a main sort of section that highlights this, Acts chapter 11. And the context here is sort of a culminating point in Peter's ministry. We can find uh, in the first part of the book of Acts, Peter is the prominent, prominent apostle that God uses. And Luke traces his ministry in the beginning of this book. But then Luke gives this very deliberate and specific account in chapter 10. And it has a place of prominence in all of Peter's ministry, because this is really the first time that Peter brings and and God sends him to a a family of Gentiles, and he preaches the gospel to them, and they're saved through faith in Christ. It happens in chapter 10 with the household of Cornelius. He goes and he preaches the gospel to them, and Verse 44, chapter 10 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Okay, And they spoke in tongues, same as in in Acts chapter 2, when the all Jewish apostles received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. All right? So Acts chapter 11, now it comes to Peter describing this to the church there in Jerusalem. Acts 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. It's a violation of the law. No doubt these were Jewish Christians of a Pharisaical bent. They they show up later on in, in Acts 15. But Peter then reports about this, why it was legitimate for him to do so. And basically he says, look, God sent me to go do this, and I did it. And when I did, here's what happened. Verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he concludes, if God gave them the same gift as he gave to us also, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is I that I could stand in God's way? That's really good reasoning, right? He says, God is the one that did this. God's the one who did the saving. 
God is the one who did the converting. God poured forth his Holy Spirit. What could I do? Right? This happened. And that settles the matter for the church. Notice again this summary in verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, now this is their conclusion, then to the Gentiles, also God has granted repentance that leads to life. See? They're fully Gentiles. They hear the message of the gospel, and they believe the gospel. But as a summary, the church concludes that God has granted them repentance that leads to life. Did this include faith? Of course. For Peter says the same gift as when we believed, right? There's so many important features of this summary. And the biggest one is they say God grants. God grants repentance. God grants repentance. So important for us as we talk about this issue to make sure we keep that in mind. When, when, when repentance and faith together Repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross is produced in the heart of a person. It is always a work of God's grace by the Holy Spirit. That's so important for us to keep in mind. That will keep us from thinking or supposing that talking about repentance implies that it's some kind of a work, right, that is a condition of salvation. That's often the charge against this view. As if repentance and feeling contrite and sorrow and broken over sin could somehow appease the wrath of God. You know, like a child sort of crying fervently to get out of trouble or something like that. That's not what we're saying at all. At all. There is no way to appease God's wrath for your own sin. There is no way. No degree of self-righteous works can you offer to God and say, well, God, I know I've sinned, but at least I've done these things. Could you count that? It does not work that way before a holy God. The only means of atoning for sin is the cross of Christ. And the good news is it atones for our sin completely and perfectly. And that's why faith in Christ and what he's done on our behalf results in salvation. Repentance is not a work that can can appease the wrath of God for sin or atone for your sin before God. But it is appropriate because we have sinned against him. It's appropriate to feel remorse over our sin. It's appropriate to turn away from our sin, to see it for what it is. And when that happens in a heart, it's a work of God's grace. We describe that as conversion. Again, last week we said that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin, and they're two inward uh, dynamics of the soul when God brings about conversion in someone's heart. And so this is pointed to in this key verse, verse 18. God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. There's also a summary of Paul's ministry later in the book of Acts. If you turn over to Acts 26, that was our key passage that we read this morning. <clears throat> and again, we come to somewhat of a culminating point in Paul's ministry here. <clears throat> We're getting towards the end of the book of Acts. And the theme and, and uh, the, the context here began in Acts 21 when Paul is arrested in Jerusalem by the Jews. This had been prophesied. He knew it was going to happen. He travels down to Jerusalem. And while he's there, he goes into the temple and he is pointed out by Jews that had become familiar with him when he was ministering in Asia, which is modern day Turkey, in the in the church, the prominent churches there like Ephesus. And he goes into the temple. They see him. They tell the Jews in Jerusalem, this, this guy is a troublemaker in what he's teaching. And so they arrest him. Chapter 22, he makes his defense before them on the spot. Later in chapter 23, he is tried before the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin. In chapter, um, uh, and later in the chapter, there's a conspiracy formed to kill him. And so the Roman authorities move him up to prison in Caesarea. There in chapter 24, he is tried before the governor Felix, who does nothing about it for two whole years. 
And Paul is stuck there in prison in Caesarea for that time. Felix is replaced by Festus in chapter 25, who tries and hears Paul's testimony. Following that is another trial before King Agrippa. This is Herod Agrippa II. And that brings us to our context here. So this passage is, is couched in Paul describing for Herod Agrippa II about his conversion and his ministry and his preaching predominantly among the Gentiles. And Paul, we, we, we hear about and see his conversion experience and his calling in Acts 9. It's, you know, one of the prominent themes in this whole book. It starts there in Acts 9, and Luke is with Paul in, in his ministry later on through the bulk of the book of Acts. But here is Paul's own recalling of when Jesus confronted him on the Damascus road and called him to his ministry. We can jump in in verse 12. Acts 26, verse 12. <clears throat> he says, In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. This is before his conversion, when he is persecuting the church. Verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. This is Paul's well-known, famous conversion experience where the ascended Christ appears to him on the road, interrupts his persecution, and converts him. And, and Saul is no longer Saul. But rise and stand on your feet, he says, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things which you have uh, seen me and to those in which you will appear. That's a pretty rough translation. New King James does it better to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Now, as Paul goes on to describe this experience to King Agrippa and this calling from directly from Christ, notice how central the theme of repentance is. All right, verse 17. It says, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles, All right? So that's a, a, describing Paul's, how he'll be persecuted, but Jesus will be with him to deliver him from your people, the Jews who will persecute and the Gentiles who will, to whom I am sending you, All right? I'm sending you to the Gentiles primarily to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And that turning language is the doctrine of repentance. And we don't just find that in the New Testament. Repentance all throughout the Old Testament is described in that simple verb and that concept of turning from sin to God. Here, from darkness to light from the power of Satan to God. And notice also, again, that this concept of repentance is not some kind of a separate work added on to faith, but it is all part of someone's conversion when they turn in this way and also receive the forgiveness of sins and find a place, he says, among those who are sanctified by faith in me. All right, again, it is all part of that saving work that God does. If you have been saved by God, it means that you have experienced this repentance from sin and faith in Christ. Similar kind of uh, uh, description of our salvation is in Colossians 1, 13 through 14, where it says that all of us have been rescued from the dominion of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. So Paul's ministry here is particularly to the Gentiles in view. It's emphasized. He preached in the synagogues, yes. But Paul, more than any other apostle, went further into the world of the Gentiles than, than others. And this was the reason that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. That's repentance. And receive the forgiveness of sins and be sanctified by faith in Christ. There's no sort of false contrast made here, pitting faith against repentance. Those are not two conceptually distinct things. They are, again, two dynamics of the soul when God makes someone alive by the Spirit. 
Now notice how the passage makes this clearer. Verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and then in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and also to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. All right. Now we can just apply or think about that contrary view that says that, well, repentance for the Jews, uh, grace without repentance for the Gentiles. How, how would that work here with this verse? Declared to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, that would be mostly Jews, then in the region of Judea, and then also to the Gentiles, same message. They should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Now notice that last phrase too in this verse. Performing deeds in keeping with their repentance, right? This is the same exact concept we just saw in Luke chapter 3, in John's ministry. Luke 3, 8, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And again, this is not saying whatsoever, bear fruit in keeping with repentance because that is conditional upon your salvation. No way. The word there in keeping with is the idea of something that is fitting or appropriate. So we have this internal contrition and sorrow over our sin. We know we have sinned against God and are guilty before God. And inwardly, there is a desire to turn from that. Well, when it's genuine, it is fitting that our, our actions follow. And if, it's, if it is genuine, they will. Just like a tree bears fruit. The tree doesn't have to pop out a fruit. Part of the metaphor is that it is the nature of the tree to bear fruit. Same thing with genuine salvation and conversion. Repentance is essential. If the Spirit has done that work in the heart of someone, the Spirit will produce the fruit of the Spirit. So we've seen some bookends here, right? These are like signposts along the way in this progress of the gospel. We begin at the very beginning to hear repentance in the mouth and the proclamation of John the Baptist and Jesus side by side, right? And then we hear the same thing after his resurrection in the Great Commission. And then even as we sort of jump into the, the high point of Peter's ministry to the Gentiles, we hear repentance. And then also at the very end, after Paul has done tons of ministry, we hear that this is what he has been doing, proclaiming repentance and the gospel. These are signposts, guideposts along the way, and there is a consistent continuity between them. I hope you can see that this morning. So much for two distinct gospels, one for Jews about the kingdom, a one for Gentiles about grace. So much for this false notion that somehow preaching repentance in a gospel message is akin to preaching a gospel of works. If that's what you think about repentance, then you have got to lay that charge at the feet of Jesus, John the Baptist, Peter, and Paul, because that's what they preached. You'll have to take up the argument with them. In my mind, this is so plain and so emphasized by the very inspired authors of the New Testament that it is hard to miss. And it's essential, if we think about it, that we follow suit as they proclaim the gospel with this essential component of repentance that we do the same. Unless someone comes to Christ in repentant faith, they cannot be saved. But if that's how they come, they are saved to the uttermost. Now, there's a lot of scripture between these guideposts, right? Someone can say, well, Pastor Dave, you know, you're just sort of jumping to the key passages that suit your, suit your view. There's a lot of scriptures in between. What about those? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because that's where we're going to go to next. But I'm trying to get away from going too long, so... I'm going to show some mercy this morning, and we'll conclude with those guideposts, all right? You'll notice that you, you're welcome. <laughs> You'll notice that next on your outline gives you an idea of where I'm heading, 
And these sort of logically progress. Okay? We want to look at Jesus himself proclaiming the gospel more thoroughly throughout Luke's throughout Luke. We'll, we'll skim some key passages again, because we're in Luke, we're going to get to those in detail, but we'll skim some of them to see this theme as it develops unmistakably in Luke's gospel. And then we'll move on to look at the book of Acts and how the, the content of the gospel is proclaimed in examples given there by the apostles. And then we want to turn to the depiction of repentance and just see how individuals respond to Christ in repentance and faith. And then also how crowds in the book of Acts respond to the gospel with repentance and faith. And again, it is just to demonstrate how how dominant and consistent of a theme this is throughout the New Testament. And that that is essential to know the gospel aright. A couple takeaways for this morning. First, this is the kind of approach that a healthy church should have, a church that believes in the scriptures and believes that the the word of God is our sole source of divine authority for faith and practice. That's what we believe. That's the heritage of this church. That's where we should continue. This is a perfect example of how and when we should go back to the scripture to see the mind of God on this matter. And this is the approach we should take for any doctrine. Uh, Furthermore, But also, if repentance is this essential component of the gospel's content, it means that when I talk to someone else about Christ and when I talk to someone else about salvation, it is necessary that when I invite them to respond, I include this as well. We we can't give the impression to people that Jesus is wonderful and the good news of the gospel is that he's okay if you just stay with your sin. Listen, if that sounds good to someone, they're probably not at the right place spiritually. Right? If someone comes to this whole equation and thinks, well, I'll come to church as long as the God that you describe can accommodate himself to me, and, and my what I like to do, my, my sin, because I'm not leaving it. If, if that's sort of the approach, they're dead in their sins and transgressions. There is no spiritual life there. There is no work of the Spirit. Not yet. Because it begins with a conviction of sin. That's what the Spirit does. The good news of the gospel is not that. If that's the message and it sounds good to the hearer, That's not it. The good news of the gospel is that when we repent of our sins, God fully forgives us and reconciles us to himself, and we can come to know God in truth. The good news of the gospel for sinners like tax collectors and prostitutes, which this is a dominant theme in Luke's gospel, is that they can be cleansed from their sin that they don't have to stay stuck in their sin, that they don't have to stay condemned in their sin. The good news of the gospel is that there is eternal life and full forgiveness and full inheritance in heaven in spite of being a sinner. When we deserve judgment, God has sent his son in love to rescue us from his judgment because he bore it in himself out of love. That's the good news of the gospel. And so it has to be included in our message as we talk to people and and preach to people and teach people and describe to them what this Christian life is all about. It's through repentant faith, not just faith superficially, like, oh, I believe in God, and so I'm going to heaven. James says the demons believe. Demons believe the correct content about God, and they have absolutely no salvation, right? It must be repentant faith in Christ as a sinner in need of grace. That's how we come to have salvation. Third, and most importantly, this morning, have you responded to Jesus and the gospel with initial repentant faith? I imagine that there are some this morning who have not. It is not wrong to think through the implications of this truth. 
In 2 Corinthians 13, Paul says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you unless indeed you fail the test? It is not wrong to examine ourselves and our faith. And there are wonderful, wonderful indications of genuine faith. But lip service is not one of them. Believing truth things is not one of them. And Jesus teaches that the best way to know a tree is by its what? Its fruit. If you see a love for God in your heart and a love for his word and a, a desire to turn from sin and be right with God and a love for God's people and a desire to worship Christ to make him first in your life, it, however imperfect that might be, those are the fruits of a changed heart. But if there is an absence of those things, examine yourself this morning. Examine yourself. Why would you come to church if you're not right with God? You might be right with the church. You might be in the right church. If you're not right with God, that is an eternal, weighty matter, and nothing else you do in this building matters until we get that right at the core. That's first. That's first. We're not doing religion here. We're doing eternal life here. That's what the gospel is for. And so come, come to God this morning. On the other side of repentance, you will find not his judgment, but his love and his life. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. Draw us to yourselves, whether we're, we're, we're not saved yet, not a Christian yet, or whether we are and whether we need to turn from things in our life. Draw us to yourself. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity on this issue. And none of us are perfect. All of us have need of repentance on an ongoing basis. But especially this morning, Lord, if someone is in need of that initial repentant faith in Christ, Bring them to yourself, Lord, now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you would please stand with us. We're going to sing hymn number 309, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Oh. Uh-huh. 
come to you with grateful hearts this morning for the clear proclamation of your word. Oh, Father, I pray that indeed you will work in us through your Holy Spirit to grant us repentance as we open our hearts in faith to this Christ who shed his blood on the cross, who went to that extreme sacrifice because of the repulsiveness and the abominable nature of sin itself, dear Lord. I pray indeed our hearts will be smitten with the reality of sin in our lives. O oh God, reach into our hearts, I pray. And because we believe you and we trust you, I pray, dear Lord, that you will produce this fruit of repentance in our lives. Even as an apple tree produces apples, Lord, may a life that has true faith produce the fruit of repentance and turning from sin and continuing to do so as we need to Lord, every day. Thank you. We love you and praise your name and we trust you to be at work in us to make us a body of believers that truly love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and then we can truly love each other and bear each other up and support each other and encourage each other to love and good works together for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you.